Released in 1996 by id Software, three years after their initial release of Doom, Quake is often seen as a cornerstone of gaming's history, and one of the most fondly remembered shooter games and PC games of the late 90s. Quake was actually conceived as an action game in a 3D world, inspired by Sega's Virtua Fighter. It was even supposed to feature similarly inspired melee combat, but was considered too big of a risk for the software at hand. This disagreement was cited as one of the largest impetuses of designer John Romero's departure from id Software, before he developed Dai Katana, a game of infamously poor quality and one of the largest commercial failures in the history of gaming. Romero wasn't the only member to leave after Quake's release, however, with many of id Software's developers citing creative differences and a complicated development cycle as their reason for departure upon the game's completion. Despite its bumpy path to creation, Quake still managed to be a revolutionary release from the ground up, changing many ideas in terms of gameplay structure, technical foundations, and even how fan bases and communities could interact with their favorite games. Lead programmer John Carmack developed not only Quake's revolutionary 3D engine, but also a complex networking model used for online multiplayer, which was much more accessible and robust than the multiplayer capable in Doom, or for that matter, most online PC games of the time. Carmack's original Quake C programming language even helped popularize fan-made mods, a few years before Valve's Source Engine would raise the modding community to a new modern era. The first major Quake mod that you've most likely heard of was a class-based Capture the Flag mode called Team Fortress. Upon public release, Quake's engine was also adopted as the basis of Valve's first engine, Gold Source, which was used in their debut game, Half-Life. Though Quake was even more highly praised by critics than either Doom or Doom 2 Hell on Earth, a shaky release resulted in Quake's sales not quite reaching the same magnitude as either of id Software's previous hits. It was still commercially successful, however, and even saw console releases on the Nintendo 64 and Sega Saturn within the following years. Let's establish how this melancholic shooter cemented itself in gaming history as we uncover what's so great about Quake. The plot is a little difficult to piece together, but the main premise of Quake is that humanity has been experimenting with teleportation technology, known as Slipgates, and now an enemy referred to as Codename Quake has found a way to use these Slipgates to its own advantage by sending death squads into the human dimension. The only surviving soldier of one of these attacks, referred to as Ranger in later entries, must now collect four separate runes from the enemy dimensions in order to stop Quake and prevent the invasion of Earth. The game is composed of 30 levels, split into four chapters of about seven or eight stages, with the player starting with basic equipment at the beginning of each chapter, not retaining their items from previous stages. New players are able to select from three difficulty settings before hopping into the action, although there is actually a secret fourth difficulty called Nightmare, which was apparently so frustratingly hard that it had to be hidden so players wouldn't select it by accident. Quake's dark medieval atmosphere was inspired by gothic fiction, most notably the works of H.P. Lovecraft. To match this melancholic aesthetic, the soundtrack was actually composed by Trent Reznor and his band Nine Inch Nails, with Reznor also providing the protagonist's grunts and other vocal inputs. Reznor claims that Quake's soundtrack is not actually music, but a sinister and frightening amalgamation of ambient drones and mechanical sounds, which certainly gave the game's dark world a bit more liveliness without making it feel like an arcade game. Quake seems to be the earliest example of a first-person game in which the player can move however they want, in order to attain a very natural sensation in the gameplay. Consoles hadn't quite evolved to the usual twin-stick control that we're used to these days, and computer games couldn't quite come to a consensus on how to move, look, turn, strafe, and in fact, even incorporating the mouse at all was pretty revolutionary. This was no longer an adaptation of the sort of controls you may see in an arcade. This was a control scheme, and a fully customizable one at that, which allowed the player nearly full control of their character, and jettisoned PC gaming into its own separate branch of the overall gaming ecosystem. Early ports of the game had basic control defaults similar to those found in Doom, 
but players could activate mouse looking with a held button or assign individual keys to your camera's pitch and yaw. Both of these methods accommodated a vast array of players who were all discovering new comfortable ways of controlling a character in 3D, and especially a quick first-person one like in Quake. With the incorporation of mouse controls, the player can move and look freely in Quake, which was revolutionary for shooters and plenty of adventure games too, which often included tank controls such as turning in place or strafing with the use of a separate button. This is also the earliest instance I can think of in terms of jumping in a first-person game. Since the game allowed the player to be capable of more complicated maneuvers with reasonable ease, more could be expected of the player when balancing Quake's fair degree of challenge. Accuracy now began to matter a lot more than your typical arcade shooter or Doom clone, and it was harder to take pot shots from far off in the distance. Strafing also wasn't usually enough to dodge enemy fire on its own anymore. The player was expected to utilize their entire environment to avoid losing health, ducking around corners and keeping solid structures between them and their enemies. You can tell this is still a little early in the timeline of first-person shooters though, because you don't really interact with your environment outside of shooting and moving. It wasn't really until the PC releases of Half-Life and Thief in 1998 that you could actually open doors and activate items around you with button presses, rather than just running into a door at high speeds with the right keycard. Part of the reason that the Quake engine is so historically significant for gaming, and especially the first-person format, is because it was the first engine to come up with a much faster way to render 3D environments through a map system which then became industry standard. To put it simply, even if a player were in a room built out of solid boxes in a 3D space, the computer isn't processing the other side of the wall, instead only loading the playable area and not the rest of the polygons used to construct the game's world out of the player's sight. Even the game's sky is rendered on the viewable side only, being one of the first noted instances of a sky box in a video game as well. The environments in Quake are a lot more cohesive than Doom's, simply because the 3D architecture more easily allows the player to understand how the world is stitched together, allowing for better positional awareness and sense of surroundings. As you play through Quake, it's easy to notice a compounding list of little things that are now present in nearly every first-person shooter game. The grenades bounce, explosions have splash damage, and the enemies give more visual indication of when they are attacking, even if it's with something like bullets that would be impossible to see. At least adding effects like muzzle flares gives an attentive player more indication that they're in danger before they actually take damage. With the inclusion of high-quality ambient lighting effects, explosions and muzzle flashes do actually cast light on the immediate area around them, rather than just being an animation for the sake of hitboxes. Now, players can see in dark corners with a flash from their shotgun, and it's easier to know when a grenade has gone off by the visually impressive blast. Since the player now exists in a true 3D space, so do their weapons. Grenades and rockets are now affected by more realistic physics, and the player can track incoming threats more easily, as well as smoothly aim and lead their shots while moving for fast-paced gameplay. Enemies are also far more responsive and involved with the game's world, actually faltering and recoiling when being shot by the player. They may even collapse to the ground for a moment before struggling up to fight some more. This was a big step for 3D modeled characters from two-dimensional sprites that would simply disappear when destroyed or turn into a pile of different, messier pixels. Even the Nintendo 64 wouldn't be released for a few months, so the animations witnessed in Quake were some of the most compelling 3D graphics to be seen, especially in the comfort of one's own home. One of the most notable features of Quake is that it simply feels like the first modern first-person shooter, the first of its genre that we know today. The freedom of player movement, as well as the accessibility and comfort that came with smooth camera control and adjustable field of view, all became standards in the first-person experience, regardless of genre. Its revolutionary game engine changed the framework of how first-person shooters operated, and even how inventive and complex game engines should strive to be. Beyond the engine and gameplay, Quake even influenced the structures of many commonplace fandoms and communities in the gaming ecosystem. For instance, Quake was one of the first games to popularize speedrunning as a virtual sport with a subsection of the community recording in-game demos of themselves completing the nightmare difficulty in under 20 minutes. 
With the release of this demo, known as Quake Done Quick, any player could watch it, learning the tricks necessary for a fast run, and even attempt to beat this record themselves. Quake was also one of the first games with a popular machinima community, well before Halo Combat Evolved, in which players could use the game's engine and demo recording software to create fan-made films for release online. I think the reason you hear about Quake so frequently is the fact that it was both the beginning and end of an era, whether that was what people realized at release or not. This was the culmination of a lot of technical knowledge that had been circulating around gaming networks for the last few years, finally coming to a head in one of the most important games to lead us into the modern era. The reason people always mention Quake as a great game, outside of just being a fantastically crafted experience, is because this was the predecessor to Half-Life, and Medal of Honor, and Halo, and most other modern shooters that you can think of. All of those games and franchises look and feel the way they do because of Quake. Id Software's newest release set a very high bar for what first-person shooters could be. A bar so high that, other than natural visual improvements and a few unique mechanics here and there, the general format of first-person shooters has hardly even changed since Quake's release. That is what's so great about Quake. Thank you all for joining us on this episode of What's So Great About Gaming, as we explored every dimension of Quake. Want to see some bonus content? Maybe support the creation of these videos? If so, check out the What's So Great Discord, Twitch, or Patreon. Links for all of those are in the description. If you want to hear what's great about another game, check out the link to our last episode, Sonic Adventure, on screen or in the description. And please take the time to subscribe to be involved in the discussions here. Thanks again for watching. Now go play a great game. We'll see you next time.